Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. Today, I'm delighted we're speaking to Maria Leastam. Maria is a Welsh-British polar adventurer and a Wales 2016 Year of Adventure ambassador. She was the first person to cycle to the South Pole from the edge of the continent in 2013. You have done some phenomenal challenges, some phenomenal adventures from Marathon de Sobs, from cycling to the South Pole. So you've been in, you know, supremely hot deserts as well as sort of, you know, some of the coldest places on earth. But how would you introduce yourself? Well, I generally refer to myself as an adventurer. Um, I, I purposely don't use the word explorer because I think that that word is reserved for uh, you know, the heroic explorers of our time, um, you know, the Scots and the Amazon um, type people that really went out and explored places for the very first time. I'm more out seeking adventure. Um, and with my latest expedition, the, the Cycling to the South Pole, that was uh, about looking at how we can use, you know, modern day techniques to to achieve amazing things. So, um, you know, cycling had never been proven at all in Antarctica. So I set out on a mission to try and prove that it was. So I'd say an adventurer, definitely. Oh, fantastic. And when you were younger and growing up, did you always want to be an adventurer? Well, I, I actually wanted to be an astronaut. Um, I always said to my mother, I want to be an astronaut. Uh, when I was probably about eight years old, that dream began. Um, but I've always been very fascinated in the world. I, my parents bought me one of those globes um, that I'd have next to my bed. And I'd always spin that and, and look at all the different places on it. And, you know, yet when, I was, when I was young, which is, well, I'm 39 now. So, you know, so 30 odd years ago, you know, if tra- where travel wasn't as accessible as it is today, it was a real fascination to me. So I think I've always had that desire to want to go and, you know, see what's what's behind a closed door or go and see see what's going on elsewhere and and you know to see what the world had to offer to offer us really so um yeah I think I think I have always had that in me what was your childhood like oh I had a really idyllic childhood actually I um grew up on a farm yard on a farm not in a yard (laughs) I grew up on a farm um with lots of animals um my parents are incredibly inspirational people they um, ran a lot of their own businesses. Um, they, they also worked for other companies. My father worked for British Gas. My mother was a journalist. And um, yeah, they were, always, they were always very, very supportive in whatever I wanted to do. I was never told that I mustn't do something or shouldn't or couldn't do anything. Um, they allowed me to go out and really experiment. And I think that's that's been the key thing to go and experiment and learn through doing um, has, has definitely helped me. So yeah, I had a fab, fab upbringing I love that you know the experiment the learning through doing I mean was was there a point I mean for me it was you know Duke of Edinburgh scheme a scheme was like one of the first times that I you know got outdoors it was doing the camping I still remember I can't remember it was the bronze one when you had to walk for like 50 miles actually might have only been 25 miles for bronze and I was thinking that it was the you know the biggest distance the furthest distance how I was never going to be able to complete it but do you remember back to a time in, in your childhood was there anything and a challenge or an expedition or an experience that stands out for you? Um, I think, you know, our, our back door was permanently open and uh, we had fields and, you know, garden and fields and, and, you know, I was able to just run out whenever I wanted to. And the only, the only thing my mother would always say is, right, you've got to get your all in one waterproof on, then you can go and roll in manure heaps and do whatever you like. <laughs> Um, so I would just have the freedom to go out. So every day for me was an adventure. I would I would camp in our back garden even when it was raining. You know, I was just out doing that sort of thing. And and it wasn't really until later in life um, when I went to university. I was in the officer training corps when I was at university. And that's where the whole expedition things really began. Um, because obviously I was doing the military training. But then I got into adventure sports as well. Um, and that's where my first sort of experience of real expeditions um, and things began. And I, I got into uh, doing more extreme things then. So I didn't do the Duke of Edinburgh at school. Um, I'm not really sure why. I just think it might not have been 
as accessible to me then or it wasn't something that our school really picked up and, and did um I, when I was at school I, I I did did do a lot of sport there I was very playing tennis actually um and I played tennis for, for South Wales um so I did I was always sporty um but from an expeditions point of view it was it was later when I was at university that that really all began what was it like sort of joining the university officers training corps were there lots of other women involved at that point who wanted to do that as well yeah, not so many women. Um, certainly more men. Um, I, I've I've always been in that environment all through my career as well because I've worked in a, you know in engineering type environments. Um, I studied mathematics at, at university as well, so um, I've always been really in a man's world. Um, and in a way that that has helped to really spur me on as well, because it's it's trying to prove that, hey, just because I'm a woman doesn't mean that I'm I'm any less or any less capable. Um, I can do just as much. So um, at the officer training corps was definitely more more men there. Um, but it was a fantastic. I'm so pleased that I did it. It was one of those things that I look back and I say, combining my maths degree with the officer training corps were the two things that really set me up and made me who I was and gave me all the opportunities. Because with the officer training corps, it was all about, you know, how to work in teams, how to develop really strong relationships, how to tackle challenges and problems, how to be comfortable with yourself in really harsh environments and all those things are such a key to my learning um, and certainly moving into the worlds of expedition and becoming an adventurer you've got to know how to look after yourself and you've got to know how to appreciate environments and things like that so it was brilliant absolutely brilliant I, I, I can't recommend it enough uh, for anyone that's at university. I mean talking of expeditions and getting into the world of adventuring I think I don't know if it's just because I'm sort of now in this world and I sort of see more people are <laughs> interested in it and they, and they want to get involved in it. What was your journey of progression? I mean, how did I mean, for me, it was I think, you know, it started with running and running London Marathon and gradually, you know, increasing the distances and so on and so forth. What was it for you? Well, I, I don't ever do things by half at all. And um, the Marathon de Saab was really the first big thing I did. Um it was an idea that I had with a friend at university. In fact, no, it was after. It was shortly after university. Um, I think we were probably in a pub and thought it would be a good idea to run across the desert. <laughs> um, a lot of good ideas stem from pub conversations, <laughs> I think. Um, and it was back in 2005 when we had to send the deposit off for it. And without even thinking, I just sent the deposit off and then realised, OK, hang on, I've just signed up to run uh, six marathons in seven days across the Sahara Desert. And it was really, you know, it was setting a goal like that that then made me get into it a bit more and start to do more serious running. I've, I've always done quite a bit of running. Um, you know, university, I used to run a lot in the OTC. I used to run a lot at school. I, I love doing cross country um, running at school and the more long distance stuff but I'd never really seriously been into any of it so having set myself this huge challenge um, I had to now go and start training and that's when I started running half marathons marathons ultra marathons um, all in the in the lead up to that. Tell me about the lead up in terms of nerves or being anxious or worried about this challenge which is you know obviously outside of your comfort zone at this at that point in time what was that like for you yeah it was, uh, yeah it was hugely outside of my comfort zone for n for a number of reasons um firstly the heat um I was not accustomed to that sort of heat it was about 48 degrees celsius um I'm much better in cold so the fact of the heat was just a, a huge, huge issue for me. And I was worried about, I was really paranoid about dehydration and hypothermia and, um, and not hypothermia, dehydration. Um, and, and, you know, not being able to manage myself in those conditions. Um, the year that I actually ran it, there was a French guy, unfortunately, that after the double marathon, he went to bed that night and he never woke up again. He'd pushed himself so hard um, and after that, you know, it made me really realize that you've got to know yourself, you've got to know your own body. And, you know, you've got to know how to deal with with yourself in those particular conditions. So, you know, in the lead up to it, I, I really spent a lot of time just trying to understand how my body responds to this sort of extreme, extreme amount of sport. And um, of course, the temperature was something I couldn't really 
prepare or train myself for but I could become prepared for it so I made sure I always had a cap on I actually ran with a big sarong over my head on 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 some of the days to create a full um blanket of shade for myself um I knew I was quite susceptible anyway to to sunstroke and things so um again it's very much on the mental side as well I think if you think you're going to go down you're more likely to go down than if you know you feel strong and you feel prepared and that's why preparation so important because it helps you then to be mentally strong um not just physically strong um but yeah it was an incredible incredible challenge um and actually as the days went on I got stronger I got fitter I got more confident and I was actually then able to start to really push myself a little bit harder um towards the end of it but I did start slowly um and I made sure that I took care of my feet um the feet are the one thing I think you always hear when when people talk about the marathon de sable um, as, as a terrible state their feet were in and the blisters and the sores and all that sort of thing. And I managed to finish running it with not a single blister or not a single sore and not a single ache and pain because of the way that I managed myself through it. Um, so, yeah, I, I was I was really pleased um, and it was a really valuable lesson for me as well in self-management. I mean, it's interesting, almost coming back to, to the point you made earlier, it's like it's, it's knowing how your body responds is just so incredibly powerful whenever you do any type of endurance race or, or physical challenge. Well, doing that race and you know subsequent races that you've done, what do you think you've really learned about your body? Is it in terms of just not necessarily just like pushing through, but in terms of like body management? Yeah, I think we are all generally a lot more capable than we think we are. Um, and, and it's all to do with management of pain, because with with endurance sport, it's going to be painful. And I think those that do better at it are the ones that can, in a sense, recognize and understand and feel the pain, but be able to say, OK, well, is this is this a bad pain, i.e. a pain that means I've got to stop? Or is this actually just a pain that because I'm tired or because my body's saying, you know, this is quite hard work, but it's not, a, you know, a pain that's a, a showstopper pain. And it's understanding the difference between the two of those. Um, you know, sometimes I'll go out and I'll train and it's just the wrong day and I'm feeling I'm not feeling well and there's no point pushing through that because I'm then going to do more damage. But on other days, you know, I run up a really steep hill and I think, oh, this is really hard work, but it's not the kind of pain that means I'm going to do myself damage. Actually, if I can push through it, I'm going to benefit myself because I'll be stronger next time. So, it, you know, it's it's that kind of thing that you do learn, but it takes a lot of trial and error. It takes a lot of time um, putting yourself through those sorts of things so yeah I'd say it's the management of pain really okay. that's the key um, and what do you enjoy most about it I mean especially when you start talking about endurance you know, management of pain I can imagine a lot of people thinking why do you do it why, <laughs> why do you put your body through it through these it through these extremes what's the motivation what's the desire well you know some of us are just made to do this kind of thing it is just built in me to go out and seek for advent look for adventures um look for incredible things to do you know with the world with the with the um the south pole cycle nobody had ever done it before and the year before i went out somebody attempted to do it and failed miserably so it was something that had been proved impossible to do and for me that is too much of a too much of a thing not to go out and see whether it is possible I'm sure with the right thinking and the right expedition planning and the right mentality and you know the right people behind me you know I could go out and do it and I knew I could go out and do it and so you know something like that the fact it never been done before it was a world first you know that was something there's not many world firsts out there and certainly polar world first there's not a single woman that holds a polar world first and again it's all these things for me that was just too much to to ignore um it was too much of a pull and the other thing is going to these incredible places to be able to have you know traveled across the sahara desert in the way that i did you know not many people have done that to cycle to the south to go to the south pole even few i think i was the 200th person from an expedition point of view ever to have arrived at the south pole you know it's out of a world of however many billion that's that's quite a quite a big deal and 
Um, you know, when I went to Patagonia and did my uh, an adventure race there, we travelled across some terrain which I knew other people had never been on before, and and it's just such an ex- a magical experience. Um, and I also think that you, I've met some absolutely fabulous, incredible, incredibly inspirational people um, through the adventure racing I do, the expeditions I've done. Um, and, and it's people of the same kind that you can, you know, you can sit and you can chat and you don't have to be asked, why are you doing it? Because you, the other person just inherently knows it's just because it, it's what makes us excited. You know, it, make, it makes us want to get out of bed in the morning. So yeah, I think just meeting those people, going to all the places, um, uh, that that is really the why, definitely. I love it. I mean, we're definitely going to come back and talk about your white ice cycle, which, you know, you did get a Guinness World yes. Record for. Um, absolutely incredible, which you did in 2013. I suppose what I'm interested in is that, that time period between 2007 and to 2013 and what happened sort of in between. So you mentioned, for example, like the Patagonia Expedition Race. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So it's... Um, as soon as I got back from the, the marathon de Saab, I was very running fit and I thought, hey, I'm going to run a few more ultra marathons. So an ultra marathon is basically, you know, anything more than a marathon. So I was signing up for some 50 mile races, one of which was um, a run from Reading to Shepparton along the Thames um, path. Uh, a really, really lovely race. And during that race, I met a, a fellow competitor. Um, who was an adventure racer and he started to tell me a bit about it and again it didn't take much for me to go oh this is something I want to get involved in um, so adventure racing is for those who don't know it's uh, basically multi-day multi-sport so it all, always involves running cycling and kayaking but can also involve any other sport to the race organizer's discretion um, it's a team event so it's always four people there's three three men and one woman is it basically it's a mixed team but the optimum is three men and one woman that's what every team basically is made up for or, or made up of um and we race non-stop and it could be up to so the patagonia race for example was 900 kilometers in distance it's all self-navigated so there are just checkpoints over 900 kilometers um and that basically how much depending on how much you don't sleep or sleep as the case may be um it will dictate how long it takes you to to get to the finish so it could be anything up to about 10 days on that race um and it, again it's a huge invent- adventure in itself because you get to take part in all these different sports you get to cover amazing distances over incredible terrain sleep deprivation all of a sudden kicks in on about day two or day three when you have only had about 20 minutes in a bush somewhere um team dynamics is a huge thing as well so it's it's sport but with so much more as well it's not just sport um it's a bit of everything and i love all that i love the team dynamics i love the way things change what i really love is the fact that so men are generally stronger than women. We all know that men are generally can move faster and carry more weight as a general rule of thumb. However, when it comes to adventure racing, the first few days, they're always stronger. I'm always struggling on the first few days because they're pushing, pushing hard and I'm just trying to keep up. But then as the tables turn, actually, day three, day four, day five, women actually tend to be better at the long term endurance side of things. And I think a lot of that comes down to the fact that as as mothers, we have to have this built in reserve because when our babies need us, we can't just ignore them. We have to deal with it, however terrible or tired we're we're feeling. So I think women have this amazing um, ability when it comes to endurance. So again, that's another part of the dynamics within the team as well, just to see how that changes. And again, you'll have good days, whether you're male or female, good days, and you'll have bad days and, and how a team cope with all of that whilst trying to win a race and trying to, whether it's climb up some cliff or cycle down some single trail or or whatever they might be doing um and it's fabulous so I got into adventure racing and as you can hear got completely and utterly obsessed by it um I'm completely hooked by it and love it to pieces and just um 
I signed up once again. I did a similar thing to what I did with the Marathon de Sable. I just signed up for an expedition race in Ireland straight away. Um, I didn't try any of the the shorter adventure races because there are sort of one day ones or half day ones that you can go and 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 uh, sort of test yourself out on. I signed straight up for another big one in Ireland. Um, and, and it just really escalated from there. And I took part in the World Championships in Portugal in 2009, um, took part in some in the, U- in the UK as well. And then it was um, it was actually not until beginning of 2013 that I went out to Patagonia um, and, and raced in, in that um, race, which was a, a fabulous experience. Um, Patagonia is a very, it's, in fact, the race was called the Last Wild Race. And it was a very wild experience out there. Oh, absolutely fantastic. I mean, I think what's really interesting, I always want to go back to like like the team dynamic. So, you know, with running especially, it's although you do it with other people, it is it's just solo and marathon de sables, it's you out there fo- you know, focusing on what you've got to do to get through to get through the days. Now with adventure racing, suddenly you there is a team around you and it's and it's changed from sort of solo to team. I mean you How did you handle those team dynamics? You know, you mentioned at the beginning, you know, over the first couple of days, you're maybe struggling to keep up and you're you're, you're being pushed to your absolute limits. And then it sort of flips on day day four, day five, where suddenly, you know, you're now fully into the the endurance and and your skills are are coming out. How, How do you get that balance right? How did you manage it? So the team dynamics, um, yeah, it's a really difficult one to manage. And I've been in some teams where it's fallen apart spectacularly. Um, and I've been in some teams where it's worked really brilliantly. I think, you know, it, it, the more you get to know each other, the more you race with the same people and you learn hotspots and you learn how to deal with each other. You learn when you can push somebody and when you must back off. Um, that is really the key. It's about knowing your your teammates. Um, and quite often I, I did race with some people um, in the same teams fairly regularly, but then I'd also race in other teams so the Patagonia one that was actually fluke really that I got to do that one because it was um, a German adventure racing team sponsored by Berghaus that they'd signed up to do the race and three weeks before the race um, the female in the team had broken her leg in a skiing accident so they were desperate for another female and um, it sort of came around the adventure racing community we're looking for a female to do this race and I just thought it was I'd been training a lot for the South Pole. I was really cycle fit. I was, you know, I was mentally in a good state. And and the, the Patagonia Adventure Race was something that I'd always wanted to do for the last few years. I'd been looking at it and I just thought, fine, I'm going to go and do it. And um, and I flew out there. I'd never met any of my teammates. But interestingly enough, we actually got on really well. And it was a really, really good um, solid team and, and you know we came fourth in the end out of the world's top teams which uh, was quite an achievement um, but I think it worked well because everyone had their specific role and because when 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 the, when we all got very tired um, the guys would tend to revert to speaking German and I only understand very basic German but I think this actually helped in a way because it allowed me just to get stay almost within myself and just focus on what I was doing um and they could kind of have their banter and because as an outsider in a team it's very you've got to be very careful not to step in too much in a way because if it's a pre-formed team you could make a lot you know cause a lot of damage from that so I think the language barrier in one way was really really good because we just got on and did the job that we needed to do um and we we all worked really hard um and I think the German mentality, the way of doing things, fitted very well with me. I like to plan. I like to be organised. They were very organised. They had been studying maps. They had plans for this and options A, B, C, and and it was all. It was kind of quite regimented, which in a way I quite like that um, to a certain extent. So it worked very well. That's how I, you know, that was a lot of it. I think that was also, you know, luck. We were just lucky um, to be that group of people. And another race that I've done, in fact, the the Portugal, the the World Championships, that one uh, fell fell apart quite quite badly. Um, and it was just 
different energy levels, different approaches, different ways of doing things. One of the guys in the team, he just hadn't attended to his blisters. So by now he was walking so slowly, the rest of us were just pulling our hair out. Um, and, you know, we weren't very compassionate with each other. We weren't really supporting each other. And it just, as it started to fall apart, you could tell that it was just going to completely crumble. And, you know, it, it's so difficult with these races because whether you get to the only the only way you get to the finish line is if you bond and you get together as a team and you you know you work on each other's strengths um, and you help each other on the weaknesses without you know really highlighting those weaknesses and that's the only way really to do it but I, I really love all the dynamics of the of the teamwork side of things I think it's fascinating I mean, a, a huge opportunity in 2013 to go out to um to Patagonia to do this adventure race but also you did have your your South Pole challenge you know cycling to the South Pole how much time did you have in between the two of them um so Patagonia was in February and then I went out in December to South Pole so I had I had a fair amount of time there but because I'd been doing so much training and focus on the South Pole the Patagonia was actually a really nice break from it all to be able to go and forget about everything and just race through this incredible scenery I think did me an awful lot of good it kind of revived me and the other thing that I used because I wanted to put myself in some really difficult challenging situations I knew this was going to be really tough I knew I knew the German team were were aiming to be you know in the top top part of the race I knew they were going to push hard and and so I wanted again to try and put myself in in, in a way in a bit of in discomfort just to see how I dealt with it because going to the South Pole you know you, you can never be prepared enough for that that is an experience that you can never prepare for. I mean talking of discomfort I mean how do you deal with that what are your tips what are your tricks what have you learned by pushing your body you know, to such extremes? Yeah, I actually use a lot of um, hypnosis techniques. It's called self-hypnosis. I don't know to what extent I go into being hypnotized by myself, but it's more of having that, that mental strength to be able to say, you can do it, you can do it, this is possible, you can do it, and, and not allowing yourself to really, to doubt anything Doubt obviously creeps in a lot. It always does. But it's being able to deal with that doubt. Again, with the pain side of things, that's, again, when hypnosis has definitely helped because, you know, pain is temporary. It comes and it goes. And I think if you fear pain, it's going to be a lot worse. If you are in control of your pain and you don't fear it, it's not going to be as bad. And and that absolutely is true. The level of fear that you have in pain, if you can manage that level, you're going to get much, much further. Um, and, and I do that. Again, it's about pos- positive vis- visualization. Um, I use color therapy techniques, which is, you know, imagining a color around you, a color inside of you, a color if something's hurting on a, on a like when I was cycling on the South Pole, my knee was in an awful lot of pain and I wrapped it in, in this yellow color constantly and it just brought this warmth and radiance to it. And again, it's just, it's a mental practice. That's all it is. It's not a physical thing at all. It's just building that mental strength to help you get through things. And I'm, I'm, I can appreciate a lot of people think that's very wishy-washy kind of stuff. But for me, it works and for me it definitely helps and I'm sure it would for a lot of other people as well but you've got to give it the time and the effort and the focus to do it. So Maria in the run-up to the South Pole in terms of preparation what were you most concerned about? Preparation took basically four years from the start to going from when I came up with the idea to actually going took four whole years and the reason it took so long was because when you go to the South Pole, you can't just rock up at the South Pole. <laughs> you can't just fly into Antarctica unless you go with an organized expedition company who do who have done all the work and the logistics for you. Because what I was aiming to do, I wanted to cycle to the South Pole. Um, the route that had previously been done the year before, I didn't want to take that route because I knew it would be not the right route to take. So I'd started by looking at well where am I going to go and the area that I chose was from the Ross Ice Shelf um, which is the same side of Antarctica that Scott and Amazon set off from 
and there there are no logistics in place for getting people on expeditions to the start so I had to organize all of the logistics myself and it became a real uh, logistical nightmare uh, literally um it was very complex it was very complicated it was very expensive and I was very um worried um about that side of things um the training side um my physical training was probably what I was least worried about I knew I was capable of doing it I knew I could train myself up to be fit and strong enough to do it so that was more something just you know running in the background every morning I'd get up I'd do my three hours of fizz and 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 uh, a bit in the evening as well and that was almost the easy part I think it was the planning of the logistics getting the right polar cycle or the right cycle or the right bike for the job that was something that I in 2012 I went out to Siberia and cycled across Lake Baikal as a bit of an experiment well first of all I wanted to win the race obviously Um, but um, it was also to experiment to see what cycling on ice as well as deep soft snow um was really like I'd never really done any of it before um and I quickly learned that a two-wheeled either normal bike mountain bike or fat bike because I tested both out there um was not going to work so creating and developing a cycle that was going to be fit to get me from the edge of the Antarctic continent to the South Pole um was again a really key thing I know you asked me what was the one you know the one biggest challenge in the planning but I think it was all um a massive um challenge um raising finances to go um it's a very very in fact it's the most expensive expedition you can ever go on how much did it cost you it was over a hundred thousand pounds it was an awful lot of money how did you fund that um so I had savings as uh, some of it was through spo- all my sort of kit my equipment and that kind of thing and um, was all through sponsorship um and then I had to loan some money as well so yeah it was a very stressful time I spent two whole years I had a spreadsheet I created a spreadsheet with all companies both local ones as well as cycling related ones or ones that looked like they had some kind of you know desire to um have a, an adventurous look about them um and I had this spreadsheet full of these companies contact details took me I, I spent two years ringing emailing ringing emailing no 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 everyone was just nobody was interested it was like what do you think what do you think you, how do you think you're going to be able to do that and no we don't believe you can do that and no you're crazy and no it wouldn't give you the money even if we had it <laughs> you know these sorts of things um so it was very that was a real disheartening time um to hear how people didn't believe in it and didn't want to back the project and that was very hard very hard did you take that personally because did you think that it wasn't people not wanting to back the project but they're not wanting to back you yeah totally although I found in the in the end I found a really good way of dealing with it that at the end of the day when everyone I'd had another say 10 no's and I'd be feeling really low really sad and I would just Again, I think it's it's using my the power of the mind in a way and just saying, right, I've got to just switch all that off, ignore it, and go to bed and have a really good night's sleep. And then in the morning, get up, and it's a whole new day. It's a whole new opportunity. And those 10 that said no yesterday, well, at least I don't have to bother with those 10. I'm going to now approach another 10, and there's more chance maybe that one of those will say yes. So it was about, you know, in a way, it's quite good to eliminate as well as find new ones. Um, so, yeah, it was very disheartening. You know, I, on a number of occasions, I'd have to turn to Wayne, who was my boyfriend at the time. Um, he's now my fiance. Um, and he'd like say, no, no, keep going. You know, keep going. You can do this. So uh, he was really my rock in all of this. He really, really helped, um, helped to keep me going. I mean, I think it's it's one of those things which I think is really fascinating and it's something that the tribe have asked me to talk about more with my guests is the financial side of things because so yeah. often it is portrayed and, you know, when, when people see you see your incredible book, you know, cycling to the South Pole, a world first, you know, beautiful, stunning photographs, yeah. you know, hearing about these incredible 
adventure races you've been on, the expeditions that you've been done, the, the running races you've been involved in, and it can almost be glamorized to such an extent. So, you know, isn't it fantastic you, you know, the, the, doing this world first? But actually, the reality of the situation is from idea to completion, it took you four years. And two of those years, I mean, it sound, just sounds so demoralizing dealing with rejection and the nose. And I think this is a really key thing that people don't necessarily understand or what people don't necessarily talk about because sometimes it's always oh you're so lucky you got uh, sponsorship or funding and it's and it's really not like that I mean you, uh, uh, sorry yeah. no I was going to say you, you've absolutely hit you know you've hit it spot on there it's that when I first got to the South Pole and um and I'd achieved it and we came back and I can't remember where it was I think we got back to um, base camp at ALE at Union Glacier and I'd it was the first time I got to check my emails and check the internet and already there were things on the internet saying things like oh it's fine these fully sponsored expeditions can go out and do all these things and referring to mine and I just thought they haven't got a clue they do not know what went into that and 99.9 percent .9 of people don't know what went into it they think like you say everything's just handed on a plate and not a single thing was, in fact, I had probably had more obstacles with everything from the whole polar cycle development, the logistics side of it, the money side of it. If, you know, 99.9% .9 of people would have gone, fine, okay, I'm going to give up. And that's why they're not the first to cycle to the South Pole. You only get there first if you absolutely keep on going. And, you know, the again, there's, it's almost... Yeah, I don't, sorry, I'm trying to work out what, what I'm trying to say because I'm really passionate about this bit of it. And, the, 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 you know, people can have their opinion on, you know, what it what, what the expedition was like and things. And they've not been there. They've not experienced it. They've not they've not seen it. And and like you say, it's just the end result. And what really frustrates me is that the expeditions that get all of the the media and the publicity are the ones where, people are really good in front of the camera saying, oh, I fell down a crevasse and I almost died and I almost did this and I almost did that. They're the expeditions that get all of the, you know, that get all of the PR. And actually in reality, their definition of falling down a crevasse is probably they went ankle deep into a hole in some snow somewhere. You know, it's a, it's, it's always a massive exaggeration. That That's something I've not wanted to do with this because I don't think, it, it's fair to speak like that about these things. You know, I could certainly talk about the challenges of cycling up that Leverett Glacier. That glacier was horrific. It was steep. It was scary. There was a lot of that going on. Um, but for me, this expedition was the whole four years, not just those 10 days of being on the ice. It was uh, everything that I was dealing with in those four years from my relationship and how that was like going hot and cold because of my whole desire to want to do this um, cycling to the South Pole. And, you know, so there's so much more. There's so much more in it that, yeah, you don't see um, in the media. And it's it's all consuming as well. I mean, <laughs> I, I I think one of the reasons that I wanted to do so this summer I went out and did the Appalachian Trail is I wanted like a long oh, did you? Yeah, yeah like a, a longer challenge because um I didn't want something to be over within 7 days or 10 days so in compare you know 4 year, 4 years and I, I I I do get the the passion the drive the overcoming these obstacles picking yourself up every day after dealing with rejection after rejection after rejection thinking you're never going to make you're never going to achieve this and you're know, raising the funds and, and making it happen and you're driving it so you were, was it a big relief to actually get out there and be like oh my god I'm finally on the ice now oh it was like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders the first day I I set off and I just thought now what am I going to do? <laughs> I was pedalling away. I was thinking, now what should I do? <laughs> it was a really surreal experience. And on um, just shooting forward to sort of the, the last day and I could see the South Pole Station and I was just thinking, hang on a minute. No, it can't be over. I was I was so ready for it to be over because I was freezing. I was in diabolical pain. I was exhausted. It, it had been a, a hell of a challenge. 
But at the same time, I thought, hang on, 10 days. Wait a minute. That's crazy. You know, I, I, I've been planning so long. And what am I going to do? And my automatic reaction was, I've got to think of something else I'm going to do now. So I started thinking about my next expedition, even before I'd got to the South Pole. So the last few hours of cycling into it, I was there in my head planning the next the next challenge. So, yeah, it's, it's funny how, how our brains work, definitely. I mean, looking back now, how did it change you? Or what did you learn? I mean, did you learn more from the expedition? Or do you think you learned more from planning the expedition? Um, there was a lot more components, really, to the planning, because on the expedition, the things that I've learned um again I'd not been in Antarctica before um I had no idea that altitude um would affect me quite as much so the South Pole sits at almost 3,000 meters so it's like um you know a fair, relatively big mountain cycling up that because I cycle from sea level um all the way up to, up that um I I suffered a lot with altitude so you know there were certain things on the expedition that that I definitely learned again the the managing myself in those conditions um I was able to stop um the onset of um of a frostbite um because I managed to pick something some frost nip up earlier early enough to stop that so you know all of that self management side side of things out there um I learned a lot from again the 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 uh, the design of the polar cycle that had taken a lot of iterations and as I was cycling along again I was thinking okay well if I'm going to do this again I would um probably definitely have three wheel drive here instead of just one wheel drive and actually I'd probably have four wheels instead of three because of three I'm cutting three tracks where two I'd be cutting with four wheels I'd be cutting two tracks and but the the fundamentals of the polar cycle in fact it was had the stability meant I was able to cycle every single meter of the way and I can guarantee not a single person on a bike even Chris Hoy, when he goes out next year, he won't cycle every single meter of the way there because the fundamentals of a two-wheel bike means that you don't have the stability to stay on it, to be able to cycle through massive big snowdrifts or over huge sastrugi pieces, um, which I was able to do on the polar cycle. So, and again, for me, for it to be a worthwhile expedition, I wanted to be able to cycle the whole way. I didn't want to go out there and pull it or push it or tow it um there were two other guys that were cycling the same year that I went out both aiming to be the first and they set off three weeks before me and and uh, finished three weeks after me so they both had fat bikes one of them ended up skiing the majority of the way towing his bike on on his pulk um, and the other one ended up just pushing it at least half of the way so for me that's not really um, a, a, a very valuable cycling um, or a very um, yeah can I, inspiring cycling expedition can I just ask and did you like see them on the ice did you overtake them no so they had chosen to go the same route that the other chap had gone uh, the year before because and I understand why they went that way because the logistics are all in place. You don't have to do any of the logistics planning. You just pay your money to a company called ALE. They organize everything from the permits to the insurance, to the flights, to the um, base camp, to all the radio uh, security side of things, uh, um, the evacuation. They organize all of that. Um, You know, I had to go visit, have interviews at the Foreign Commonwealth Office to get my permits. And, you know, I had to speak to the Walking with the Wounded Expedition to try and uh, see if I could get a flight on one of their planes. I had, you know, there were so many more components to my expedition. So they went this, this, I call it the standard route, which is Hercules Inlet, which is the majority of people that say, I want to go and ski to the South Pole. If they want to do a coast to the pole expedition, they will go the Hercules Inlet route generally. Um, and that's what that company is set up there for. So they both went that route. Um, whereas I, I went um, from the Ross Ice Shelf, I had to climb up through the Transantarctic Mountain Range, which was this 3,000 metre mountain range. So um, even though my route was shorter, it was much, much steeper. Um, at some sections of the climb, it was about 25% gradient. Uh, which was steep whilst carrying all of my kit as well. (laughs) What was it like coming back for you? 
I mean, the end of this phenomenal journey. I mean, I know you've written a book about it as well, Cycling to the South Pole, which, um, you know, world first. The, the book has been forwarded by uh, Sir Ran... I always say his name wrong. Ranulph. Ranulph Fines. Um, Ranulph Fines. Ranulph yeah. Fines. So, you know, so your book is out so people can read all about it. They can go on, on Amazon and get the paperback version. They go on your website and, and get um, a copy from you. But what was it like? coming back and realizing that this dream that you had the obstacles that you've overcome the pain that you that you've had to endure for the for for that for those 10 days to suddenly you're back in the UK you're back in Wales you've completed it what what happened next well it doesn't sink in straight away I think it, it took me a good few months to really really sink in what I had done and what I had managed to achieve um so Antarctica is a very sterile environment and the first thing I remember when we landed back in Chile so I flew out of Antarctica into Chile was that all the smells in the air were really powerful um I I hadn't really noticed because being in Antarctica you don't really see much and you don't smell much and you don't really hear anything uh, apart from the wind blowing how busy our world is it really is a crazy place it smells and it's you know there's a lot of noise and there's a lot going on and uh, you know I, I I loved Antarctica it was the most impressive place in the world and I absolutely want to go back one day and um I think, you know, I was excited about coming home to be able to, you know, share all the stories and to share. We've got, um, we had a documentary on, on ITV as well, um, you know, to show others and share, you know, share a bit of my journey with everybody. But like I was saying before, before I even got to the South Pole, I started planning the next thing because for me, it, it was quite important to have some more goals um, lined up. And, and in fact, there's a few months after I got back, I did um, the Devices to Westminster Canoe Race, which is a 125 mile paddle um, along the River Thames uh, from Devices, obviously, to Westminster, um, which, which, was, which I did with a friend of mine, which was brilliant. And it was something, you know, just a, another little a, a mini goal in a way uh, for me to set my mind on um, and I think I do I am the kind of person I do always need to be able to really look forward to something and and it, you know it may, it turns me into an action woman doing that because I think it's very easy to let life just slip by and not do things and I'm not saying everyone should set crazy goals at all but you know setting goals is such an important thing whether it's something little like you know I'm gonna read this book by the end of the week or I'm gonna you know I'm going to try and start to do a bit more running so I might go and do a a 3k run one day you know just setting little goals like that I think is so important because otherwise the weeks just roll by the weeks just slip by and and um and, and you know before you know it we're all going to be old not being able to move sitting in our chairs and um have nothing to to talk about so at least I've got lots to chat about when I am all, all old and uh, and immobile <laughs> so what are the future goals like what are the do you have any more big challenges planned oh I've always got little challenges brewing, <laughs> brewing away um at the moment I'm a very busy mother of two I've got a toddler and a baby who's six months old so they're definitely keeping me on my toes and making sure that I don't lose my um my ability to operate in sleep deprived um (laughs) mode but yeah I um I love cycling I think cycling is a fantastic sport it's um it's a brilliant way to get places quickly um it's using the strongest muscles in the body um you know the glute and the and the quads um and it's 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 just a it's just a brilliant way to get around. So I think you know I'd certainly like to do something um, cycle based again. I am going to probably next year start to pick up adventure racing again um, because that's something that, like I explained before, I just really love doing. I think the team dynamic side is very exciting. Um, but you know I I I love the idea of world firsts. I've got to say, um, and I'm always looking for to see if there's anything out there that I can achieve. Of course, now I need to view things in a slightly different way because I'm a responsible mother. Um, And whether I can do something 
with the family um that would be very exciting um and we have been looking a little bit at canada and alaska and maybe doing a a, a trip across um canada and in fact i've just found out that the the town the furthest um west of alaska is called wales so i was just maybe planning a little wales to wales trip um one day possibly with the family in a in a in a, a land rover or something and i'll cycle or run or paddle or something behind might be quite a nice uh, uh, adventure to have so yeah i've got a lot of things brewing at the moment Oh, that's fantastic. And I suppose, I mean, all the all the training from your expeditions about, you know, being sleep deprived is probably coming into good fruition now with your little six month old. <laughs> yeah, she's refusing to sleep at night at the moment. It's been six months and uh, I think I've only had two nights where I've actually been able to sleep through till six o'clock. And, and just like a, because I, there's a lot of uh, there's not a lot but a, quite a few tribe members now who've just had newborns who are having children. I mean, are you still exercising? Are you managing to go out, or is that is it too soon for you? Or how, how are you still? Are you still? Are you managing to incorporate fitness into into your life? Oh, absolutely. Um, at the moment, I'm suffering awfully with a cold, so I've been off for about three weeks now. But um, I do uh, when I can. Definitely, I'll go out um, for a run because generally running's easiest um <laughs> you just need a pair of trainers and off you go um i'm lucky because we've got um, some really nice land around here as well so i can and run nice and safely off-road um on that i love off-road running i think it's much better than road running it's better for your body as well um but then i've also got um, a bike with a bow bike seat on the front so in fact before my six month old came along i would always take my toddler out and we would cycle um a good two or three times a day uh, it's not a day two or three times a week which was lovely um and I'm looking forward to her you know she she's very good on her balance bike at the moment so give her a few more years and I can't wait to go out cycling with her oh that's absolutely fantastic now Maria where, where can people find out more information about you and the different challenges that you've done so I've got a website which is marialayastam.com um, and on there, uh, this is mainly about the South Pole. And um, there's a little bit about Lake Baikal in Siberia as well, when I cycled that in 2012. Um, there's details of the book. There's a couple of show reels as well on there, a, a preview of the documentary, and also uh, about my speaking as well. So I do um, some corporate speaking as well as uh, whether it's um, in, in sports clubs as well and, and schools. And so, yeah, that's that's mainly um, the website. But the book is available on Amazon. If you just Google cycling to the South Pole uh, in the search bar on Amazon, that'll come up then. Oh, fantastic. Maria, you have you have achieved so much. And being the first person to cycle to the South Pole is absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for coming on the Tough Girl podcast to share more of your incredible story. Thank you for having me. Hey tribe, how you doing? I hope you are inspired to take up your own challenges, whatever they may be. Now, if you are interested in polar explorations, whether that's the Arctic or Antarctica, I have got some recommendations for you, some women who have been interviewed on the Tough Girl podcast. So please do go back and check out their episodes. The first polar explorer that I ever interviewed was actually Anne Daniels, who is a British um, polar explorer, absolutely phenomenal story. She had, she was going through a divorce. She was going through a job change and she was also pregnant with triplets and had triplets when she decided to go on this incredible adventure. It's how she trained throughout this. It's, you know, she talks a lot about her children, how she got the balance right. So well worth a listen. We've also spoken with Felicity Aston, who was the first woman to ski alone across Antarctica in 2012. Again, lots of really powerful discussions around being alone, doing challenges like this, the tips and tricks, you know, what got her out of the tent every morning jam-packed with information. We also spoke with Paula Reed, who was the third British woman to ski across the full distance from the coast of Antarctica to the South Pole. Paula also has this amazing ability to complete items on her bucket list. She talks a lot around goal setting, going out and achieving your, your goals and your dreams and how she goes about it. So if you are looking to learn how to set goals, how to achieve them, then definitely take a listen to Paula Reed. And then finally, 
Thursday, I've also spoken with Nick Weatherill and Nat Taylor, who are both members of the Ice Maiden Challenge, which is taking place sort of as we speak, the end of 2017, the beginning of 2018. And they talk a lot about how they're preparing to get themselves fit and ready for this. And we actually spoke to them back in 2015. So it's been a long time um, for them to prepare for this journey that they are currently on. But we will be doing a follow up with them later on in the year to find out more about what they've learned from their polar expedition. So Go take a listen to Anne Daniels, Felicity Ashton, Paula Reed, Nick Weatherill and Nat Taylor for starters. But we do have a huge back catalogue now of women that you can listen to. Incredible adventurers, explorers, triathletes, runners, swimmers, mountaineers. Um, There are so many incredible women available for you to listen. We started the podcast back in August 2015. There's now over 130 episodes, over well over 100 hours of content for you to listen to. So please do go back and check it out. Everything that you need to know is available at toughgirlchallenges.com. New episodes come out every Tuesday at 7am UK time. And let me tell you who we've got coming on next Tuesday. We have got the incredibly inspiring Antonia Bolingbrook-Kent who is a travel writer and lady venturer who has a particular love of wandering alone throughout remote regions. Her third book, Land of the Dawn Lit Mountains, a journey across Arungachal Pradesh, India's forgotten frontier, um, is available at the moment. So we talk to Antonia about her travel writing, how she got into it, how she finds exploring these incredibly remote parts of the world. You know, Antonia's been on some fascinating journeys, um, really, really fascinating lady to talk to. So excited to be sharing that with you next Tuesday. Come say hi to me on Twitter at underscore tough underscore girl. It's always great to hear from you. Do check out the Instagram channel as well at tough girl challenges. All right, guys, have an awesome day wherever you are, whatever you are doing. Just get out there, have some fun, get involved, sign up to that challenge take action take the first step to achieving your goals if it doesn't challenge you it doesn't change you take care big love speak soon bye